Bill, but I don't think he had much on you this morning. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Well done. Yes. Well done. Enjoyed that. Speaking of all our hope is in Jesus, let's turn now to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, in the text this morning. Looking at uh, how much time we had on Easter, I was kind of shocked last week or earlier this week. Um, Easter's coming up the first Sunday, a little bit early this year, but not really on average, I guess. But we have six messages counting this morning and counting Good Friday, counting Easter sunrise. Six messages. So what I would like to do is start in verse 31 of chapter 26 this morning. And if you make all six services... You will find we're going to work our way through chapter 26, chapter 27, and chapter 28, at least to verse 10. We're going to work through the night that Jesus was betrayed, which is where we're going to be today, through his trial uh, by Pilate, through his crucifixion, and of course through his burial and his glorious resurrection in the weeks ahead. So I wanted to let you all know kind of where we're going through the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's account is where we're going to be this year in the Easter season. But let's start in verse 31 as we stand together and read the verse 56 this morning. This is right after the Lord's Supper was instituted, right after Jesus shared the bread and the cup with his disciples. Verse 30, they, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So let's pick up in verse 31 of Matthew chapter 26. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. You see, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? And they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly 
One of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? And at that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out against me as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Lord Jesus, thank you for this true account of what happened. The night you were betrayed by Judas and arrested by a mob. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for inspiring the disciple and apostle Matthew to write this accurate account. And Lord, we believe these things truly happen. Just as we have read them. And now, God, we search, we search the true words of Jesus and we, we seek your will. We seek instruction. We seek what you would want us to know today in our lives. And Lord, we are so encouraged by your example. Lord Jesus, we confess we fall so short. And the message that you have for us today is to follow your example, watch and pray with you. And may we watch and pray as your people. So teach us now what we need to know. And we pray and know that you will. For we ask these things, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In verse 31, Jesus made quite a proclamation. Imagine the shock of the disciples when they heard the words of Jesus as we read them in verse 31. Imagine you were there and you were hearing the words of Christ when he said to the disciples, all of you, not a few of you, not some of you, but all of you, will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, according from Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet. So Jesus makes quite the shocking declaration to the disciples. Look, all of you are going to be made to stumble because of me this night. For it's written in the, in the prophet, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But he gives them some encouragement in verse 32. Note verse 32. He says, but... After I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. You see the assurance. What's he saying? He's like, look, you're all going to, you're going to flee. You're going to abandon. You're gone. You're going to be scattered. I know. I know. But after I've been raised, in other words, remember, I'm going to be crucified. I told you. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be given unto the Romans. And I'm going to be crucified on the cross. But I'm going to rise again. Remember? Look what he said to them. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. That one sentence, what, what assurance he gives us is like. In other words, he's saying, you're going to fail, but I'm not. You're going to abandon me, but I'm not going to abandon you. That's the assurance he gives them. But you know what? They didn't hear it, did they? <laughs> Peter immediately says in verse 33, Peter answered, Impetuous Peter, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Peter doesn't hear it. And it's not just Peter, because remember what the Bible says at the end of verse 35, and so said all the disciples, all of them said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you, Jesus. Not only Peter, but all of them said it. They didn't hear what Jesus said. Not only we're looking at their own thoughts and their own courage that they thought they had. Why? 
Number one, point number one, note the folly of the flesh. It was the folly of the flesh. The disciples were operating and conducting themselves and motivating themselves in the flesh. They were speaking through the flesh. When they said, oh, we will never abandon you, Jesus. We will always be, even if we have to die for you, we'll be here. It was the folly of the flesh speaking. Because they were with Jesus at the time, right? They were with Him. They were alone with Him. And they were gazing at His, basically, sonship. And gazing at His wonderful countenance. And His smile on His face. And the tenderness in His eyes. And they were encouraged in their flesh. And they, they thought, we'll be courageous. We're going to die with this man if necessary. But it was the folly of the flesh that was speaking. Because Jesus had told the truth, did He not? He said, all of you will be made to stumble. What does that mean, stumble? Well, the King James uses the word offended. I think the New American Standard and NIV use the words fall away. Stumble, to be offended, to fall away. It basically means, it comes from a Greek word, and I usually don't list these Greek words, but I thought you would find this interesting. Look at your outline. Scandalizo. What English word does that remind you of? Scandalize. It's where we get our English word scandalized from. Scandalizo. And it, it means in this context to cause a person to begin to mistrust and desert one whom he ought to trust and obey. And it was scandalous that they left Jesus. They should have trusted him. They should have obeyed him. But they abandoned him. And they didn't trust him. They didn't even trust that he would preserve them and they would fulfill his word. But I will go with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will go with you and I will go before you to Galilee. Because he had prayed to his father, we know. In the Gospel of John, of course, he had prayed for his disciples. And God was going to keep them. And Christ was going to keep them. There wasn't going to be any harm come to them. But they didn't want to believe that because we know what happened. They all eventually, what? Deserted him and fled. Because of the folly of their flesh. And Jesus knew this. Jesus knew this. And no, I don't think his answer to Peter in verse 34 was cruel. I don't think it was harsh. I don't think it was condescending. I think he just basically stated the truth. I don't think he said it in a yelling way or in a, in a, in a, a mean way. He just said, assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, that this night, Peter, before the rooster crows, you would have me three times. And we know that comes true, doesn't it? I don't think Jesus was... was, was Angry at Peter. He was just stating the truth. I think he knew Peter and the folly of his flesh really meant he would, yes, not deny him. I believe Jesus understood. Of course he understood Peter's heart. But he just said, no, Peter, it's not going to work that way. Because you're operating from your flesh. And it's so tempting for us, I guess, to look at Peter and say, how impetuous of you. Look at the other disciples and say, What's wrong with you guys, you know? Did you actually think you could protect Jesus or stop Him from fulfilling His Father's will? Why didn't you trust Him? It's easy for us to say, that was very foolish of you to strive forth in the flesh. But if we all examine our hearts, you know what we find? All of us are tend to have a tendency to do the same thing. We do. We have a tendency to do the same thing. In the folly of our flesh... We have a tendency to make promises to God, to say things, and to boast about things we have no business to do. Do we say sometimes to God, Oh Lord, I promise you, if you get me out of this one more time, I promise you I'll never do this again. I promise you I'll take care of it, God. I promise you, if you grant me this request, I'll never ask anything of you again. We boast, we say things in the folly of our flesh. I remember about the year 2009, I've been the pastor of my first church, South Baptist, for about a year. Maybe it was 2010, I don't remember. But I do remember I was sitting in about the third pew of that little sanctuary on the right hand side of that where Dyer was. And I remember that I was praying that day in the quietness and the stillness of that sanctuary. And I remember that I had a list out. And I remember I had listed some things that I wanted to do. I had listed some names of some people that I was going to indeed strive to get into church that year. I had about ten names and about five of them were families. And Lord, I'm going to see them in church. And I remember being so confident in my flesh that I could do it. And the reason this 
strikes me all these years later, I still remember, is because I remember saying in my heart, Lord, I haven't even begun to fight. You know who said that? I read it down by her. John Paul Jones. It wasn't biblical. John Paul Jones in 1779. He was a Revolutionary War hero, captain of a ship. That said that to a British captain, right when the British said, you ready to surrender? He said, I have not begun to fight. And he ended up <clears throat> defeating that British ship. It's a miraculous thing. Wonderful. You see, I said that out of folly in my flesh to the Lord. Lord, I haven't even begun. I was so filled with what? Enthusiasm, vigor. And yes, Lord, I can bring this to pass. I'll get these families in. We'll do these programs. And I'm going to move Salt and Baptist Church. I'm going to move this church. You know what? I was like Peter in a lot of ways. Maybe you've been there too. And the Lord knew. He knew my heart. He understood I had good motivation. But you know what? He also understood that I was operating out of folly in my flesh. And I think we could all relate. Sometimes we do. We have good motivations for God, but we don't stop and think about how much we underestimate. Now listen to me. You know what? I underestimated. I underestimated the hardness of people's hearts. I did. I underestimated the hardness of people's heart. And I overestimated my ability by a long shot. But you know what the greatest thing I underestimated? The greatest thing that I underestimated is point number two. Jim, put it up there, please. I underestimated the wisdom of watching and praying that Jesus gives us in this event. That's what I wish I would have got that the Lord has shown me since. And I want to share it with all of you. The wisdom of watching and praying. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ example in Matthew chapter 26. Look how, indeed, He shows us what to do. Now imagine this. Verse 37, he takes with him Peter and James and John, right? Three of his disciples. This was his inner group. Peter, James, and John was his inner core disciple. He takes them with him, right? And he begins, look at verse 37, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ knew what was ahead of him. Not just the physical anguish of the cross. Not just the scourging. Not just the humiliation. But most importantly, the cup of God's wrath that would be poured out upon him as he paid for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. Would you be sorrowful and distressed? Think about this. Jesus knew. He was sorrowful and look at this, deeply distressed. And he says to them in verse 38, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. And then he asked him a simple request. Six words. Stay here and watch. Stay here and watch. Stay here and watch. Peter, you said you would stay with me until death. You said you would die with me. All I want you to do, Peter, James, and John, is stay here and watch with me. You know what that word watch means? It means to be vigilant, to be expectant. It's like the watchman on the wall, watching for an invading army to come. You don't fall asleep on your watch. When you're on guard duty, you don't slumber. Watch with me, Peter. Watch with me, James. Watch with me, John. Stay here and watch with me. Because I'm exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Verse 39, he went a little farther and he fell on his face. And he did what? Pray. Don't miss the power of that. And he said this. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Father, if it is possible, 
We learned in Sunday school class this year, didn't Jesus say earlier in Matthew? This year, today. We learned in Sunday school class, remember? With God, all things are possible. So was it possible? Yeah, it was possible that this cup, this cup of the wrath and sins of the world, could pass from Jesus? It's possible. All things are possible. With God, all things are possible. But listen, listen. Just because all things are possible doesn't mean that they're God's will. Just because all things may be possible with God, all things are possible doesn't mean that's His will. So Jesus prayed, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, let me avoid the cross. I don't want to have to die and take upon the wrath of all of humanity. I don't want to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't want this, Father. Let it pass from me. Then he prayed this. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you Not as I, but as you And he came back to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. <coughs> and he says to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me for one hour? And then he says this in verse 41, which is applicable to every Christian today. We have to understand this. Look at verse 41. He said to watch and pray. Note that. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Because the spirit of need is willing, but the flesh is weak. What's Jesus talking about? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Peter, James, and John, Tommy, Roger, Wes, Nadine, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. What's Jesus talking about? What is the temptation? Don't miss this. The temptation is that we would do the will of our flesh and not the will of God. That's the temptation. Now, did Peter, James, and John, did they watch and pray? No. They didn't do it, did they? And what happened to them? Did you notice at the end of verse 56 what happened to them? All the disciples forsook Jesus and prayed. What happened to Peter later that we're going to learn? What happened to Peter later? Before the rooster crowed, how many times did he deny he even knew Christ? Three times. All because of what? In the folly of his flesh, he yielded to the temptation of following his flesh and doing the will of his flesh and not the will of God. And you know what? Every, every day, every day we face the same temptation. Are y'all aware that every day we face, I face, you face the same temptation? Every day. Every day when we wake up, we face temptation. You know what? Too many times we succumb to it. Too many times I succumb to it. We succumb to the temptation of what? Doing the will of our flesh. Doing what we want to do. Doing what is easiest for us. Every day. And not even asking God, Lord, what's your will? Not watching, not being vigilant, not being expected, and not praying. Instead, we fall on what? The folly of our flesh. We go on do we do what we want to do. And then we wonder. We wonder when the temptations come of life, and when the trials of life, and when the pressures of life come, and when the mob comes and shows up, what do we do? We run. We fail. Again and again and again. What's Jesus? What's he teaching? What's he teaching us? Watch him. And if you don't, you're going to enter into temptation. You're going to follow your flesh every time. And what is the example? How many times did he watch and pray? How many times did he pray the same prayer? Did you know this? Have you read these scriptures? How many times? Three times. I want to ask you, church, have you ever considered this? The Son of the living God, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Look at verse 44. He left and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And too often we think watching and praying is simply straight. Oh, I can, I, can, I, can, I can pray for three minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll whisper a few words. God hears when I whisper underneath my breath. Jesus is talking about intense prayer, brothers and sisters. What did he say to Peter, James, and John? Could you not watch... With me for how long? One hour. 
What does this tell us? You know what? Jesus didn't consider one hour a long time at all to spend in prayer. He didn't consider it anything to spend one hour in prayer. What's convicting us? When was the last time any of us spent an hour in prayer? I'm talking about an hour of fervent, watchful prayer. When was the last time that any of us spent that long in prayer with God, seeking His will and seeking His leading? It's convicting, is it not? But this is this example Christ gives us. Watch it. You say, okay, I guess this is another discipline i got to add to my list. This is another thing, Pastor, I'm doing wrong. Kick me in the shin one more time and make it a big old bruise this time. Come on, Pastor. Do we know what the benefit is? Point it up, put it up there, Jim. Point number three, note the benefit of this. Note the benefit of the peace and the power of doing God's work. Do you want peace in your life? Do you want power in your life? I do. Anyone else want peace and power in their life? Amen. Yes. You know what it comes from? You know where it comes from? It comes from God. And it comes from doing His will. If you want peace and power in your life, you'll watch and pray. And you'll see God's will. Because I want you to know, the calmness of Jesus, the peace of Jesus, and the power of Him. Imagine this. Judas comes up to Him. And he knows Judas is going to betray him. Because what did he say? See, my betrayer is a man. He knows Jesus is going to come up and give him the typical Jewish kiss of greeting. So young people don't get all wrapped around the axle about this and say, Ooh, Judas kissed Jesus. It was typical. It was like shaking hands back in the day. And it still is practiced in cultures all over the world. Men will come up to men and give them a kiss on each side of the cheek. It's okay. All right? Nothing going on here. Standard greeting. But that was Judas's way of identifying Christ and saying he's the one arrested. Jesus knew all of this. And Peter, in the folly of his flesh, what does Peter do? Luke identifies it was Peter. John identifies it was Malchus, the servant of the high priest. What does Peter do? He whips out his sword and he comes down to whack the guy right over the head and split his skull, but he misses and he whacks off his ear. And there's blood everywhere. And Malchus is screaming. And everybody's like, wow, look what happened. And nobody, I don't think nobody even is so shocked. They don't even try to arrest Peter. Everybody's shocked. You know what everybody's more shocked about? It's the man they come to arrest. Luke records did what? Luke records he <coughs> reached down and he put his hand over Malchus' ear and he killed him. And Matthew records Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its place. Put your sword away, for all who take the sword will what? Perish by the sword. And then notice, notice the peace and the power of Christ. Look at verse 53. Look what he says to Peter. Could you imagine this? Imagine this. Put your sword away, Peter, for all who take the sword shall die or perish by the sword. And then he says, do you not think, Peter, that I cannot now, now, pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels, Peter? A typical Roman legion, I think, was 5,000 soldiers. No, I'm sorry, it was six. I'm not good at math. What's 12 times six? Some of you are not good at math either. 72, all right? More than 12 legions. That's more than 72,000. What's Jesus? Peter, do you think that I cannot now Pray to my Father, and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. What's Jesus saying? That's possible, and I can do it, Peter. Jesus had the authority and the power to pray right then, and God would have provided Him with more than 72,000 angels. So, Peter, what do you think you're doing? But, Peter, if I did that, look at verse 54. If I did that, Peter... How then could the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must happen to us. Peter, how could God's will be fulfilled? Peter, how can I die for you? Peter, how can I save you? Peter, how can I save the millions and tens of millions of people that will come to faith in me through the centuries, through the millennia? How many... People will come to faith. Peter, how can all this be accomplished if I don't die? I could call and pray to my Father and He would provide me with the angels. He would deliver me. 
But then how would God's plan be carried out, Peter? Put your sword away. I'm going with it. Then he rebukes the crowd in a nice way. If you come out as against me as like a robber, swords and clubs to take me. Hey, I sat daily with you and I taught the word of God with you in the temple and you didn't seize me then. But look at verse 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. You know what else was fulfilled? His disciples ran away. Strike the sheep. Strike the shepherd. The sheep will be scattered. God's word cannot be broken. All the disciples ran and fled. But you know who didn't flee Jesus? The Father. And the Holy Spirit was with them. As they led him away. To be crucified. The next day. So brothers and sisters. What application do we take away from this? Say, well, nobody's going to arrest me. Nobody's going to haul me off to jail and crucify me. But I want to ask you, has these past 12 months been filled with turmoil? Are we tempted to be what? Very afraid. Are we tempted to strike off in the folly of our flesh and preserve our way of life and our way of thinking and our criteria and our desires. Are we tempted to do that? Are we tempted to point and say, it's your fault, it's your fault, and it's your fault. And if you would just stop messing up my life, I'd have a good one. You know, we're tempted to do all this. Sometimes we're tempted to say, that's to God. If you stop messing up my life, I can have a pretty good life. It's folly of the flesh. What would Jesus say to us? Stop Watch and pray. And get the peace and the power of doing God's will. Because something that we all know is true. Our lives and our culture and our country is changing. And there's a lot of things happening. Very quickly. And I saw a sign on a church building in West Virginia when I was visiting with my father back in January. And it said this. It really got my attention. It said, wake up, people. Jesus is coming. And it grabbed my attention because I thought, well, that's very true. It's like we're all slumbering, like Peter and James and John, right? We're all not off. And the sign was, the proclamation was, wake up. Jesus is coming. You better be watching. You better be praying. You better be seeking the power and the peace that He provides to do whose will? God's will. Not our will. Because you know what? We all have to answer when we stand before Him. We all have to answer. All the times we did our will. We we'll have to answer the things done in the body. Every time we chose our will over His will, we'll have to answer for that. And the Bible says we will suffer loss. We're not going to be lost. We're not going to be suffer damnation in hell because we know Christ. If you know Christ, you're saved from the wrath of God. However, you will have to answer for the things done in the body. That's what the Bible declares. You will have to answer for the things that you did in your own will and for yourself. And when you said, I reject the will of God right now, I want to do what I want to do, you might answer for that. I'll have to answer. Follow Jesus' example. Watch and pray. Stand in the power. Stand in the peace that God provides. Because now, more than ever, brothers and sisters, we need that power and we need that peace. Do we not? We need it today, now more than ever. You know what? We don't know what this next year, March of last year is when COVID hit, right about this time. We don't know what the next 12 months is going to bring us. We don't know. But if we're watching and praying and we're staying in the peace and the power of God and we're doing His will, if He's for us, there's been weaknesses. So Father, we thank You and we pray we would follow the example of Jesus Christ. 
He was in anguish. He was distressed, even to death. Yet he watched. He expected strength from you. He expected, he was vigilant that you would provide him with the courage and with the peace and the strength to do your will. And you did. And if the Son of the Living God had to go to you three times that night and pray the same thing, kept coming to you, watching and praying, how much more should we? How much more should we? So Lord, maybe you would convict some of us as you have me. Maybe you would convict some of the other saints. We need to spend more time watching and praying. We need to be coming to the throne of grace again and again and again to receive help and aid and strength in time of need. We cannot neglect prayer now. Especially now. We've got to be vigilant now. Because, Father, we need your peace. We need your power. When we look at the example of Christ how calm he was. How submitted he was all through his trial. All the accusations. All the hatred. He was so calm. He was so at peace. Why? Because you were with him. And he knew. He knew he was doing your will. Oh, Father. Forgive us. When we want to do our will. Forgive us when we are taken away by the folly of our flesh. Help us to be watchful. Help us to pray. Help us to stand strong in you. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. So, Father, now as we sing an invitation to Saul, is there anyone here who just needs to come up and say, Lord, I'm not at peace. But I want that peace. I want the calmness of Christ. In my life, would you come? Lord, is there anyone here who just wants to make a commitment to you to watch and pray more? They haven't had a good hour of prayer since they can't remember. They want to commit to that. They want that back. Once you hear it, Lord, I know you will. Brother, sister, once you come. The Holy Spirit leads you, once you come and give it out and say, Lord, I want to make that commitment. Whatever need, oh God, you know. May you draw your people. May you draw them as we see. We pray these things, Holy Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please stand.